One week ago tonight, an unarmed black man named George Floyd was killed by a Minneapolis police officer. Every day since, people all over the world have gathered to demand change and call attention to horrific racial injustices affecting communities of color every day. Joining me tonight is Van Jones, CNN's political commentator and the CEO of Reform Alliance. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, I said up front that I don't wanna do much talking tonight. I'd rather you did the talking. So why don't we start? What are you feeling right now? How are you? You know, I, um, I was as, as sad as I've ever been. Uh, I think from a black perspective as a parent, we, we, we had this one little hope, this little tiny thread that there was something we could tell our children that they could do that would keep them safe from even the worst officers. If, if, if they didn't run, if they didn't talk back, if they didn't have drugs on them, if they didn't drive away, if, if they kept their hands on, their, on the steering wheel, if they said yes sir and no, no ma'am, that you know, they, we kind of sprinkled this little fairy dust on our kids every day about how to survive you know, encounters with the police. In this situation, there's nothing we could have told our kids to survive. Uh, it was a lynching from our point of view. I mean, just literally in, in broad daylight, this guy just you know, one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, five minute, six minute, seven minutes with people begging for this guy's life. And that's, that brings back such historical trauma for us because that used to happen a lot, just the lynching of black men in public with the community being helpless. And, and, and lynchings were designed to humiliate and intimidate um, the, community, the whole community. We can do whatever we want to you and you can't do anything about it. And when, when it's law enforcement doing it, you really feel helpless. So that's why I think you see this incredible despair in the black community. Um, and I think that's why you've seen this out, outpouring. At the same time, through our tears, we, I think, might start to notice that the fear that nobody cares about us, all the white people you know, don't understand, may not be as well founded as we think. Because there's 20, 30, 40, 50 million white people who saw that video, who are also shocked and horrified and are now saying, hey, I might be late to the party here, but, but what, what can I do? Now, that is the positive. You know, out of a breakdown, you can't have a, a breakthrough. Um, and there is a positive side of this that nobody's defending. I mean, you're not seeing, you know, people may argue about the disturbances, which we can talk about. Uh, but nobody is defending uh, what this officer did. And it does create a, 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 some small bit of hope that's starting to rise up in me that we could have at least a better conversation. Plus, you're never going to get rid of police brutality just because you'll never get rid of bad schools or, or bad restaurants. I mean, you're always going to have human beings that just do bad stuff. But you can create an environment where when it happens, the response is, uh, is effective enough that you know, other people don't want to go down that same bad road. You can close down you know, restaurants that are you know, not meeting the, the sanitation requirement. You can, you can fire a teacher, you, know, you, can, you can do certain things. So you, I'm never, you're never gonna get rid of racism. You're never gonna get rid of police brutality, but you can have a better system so that you don't have lawlessness in law enforcement than leading to lawlessness on the street. That we can do. It feels to me, um, and, and again, I want, uh, you know, I, I, I want to hear how you're feeling uh, that there's an anger and there's also a, f a sense right now people are feeling very fragile. There, there's almost a, a state of people really being on the edge. And it's a mixture of feelings. It's not just anger. It's, it's also, I mean, obviously there's a lot of anger out there and justifiably so, but it's more than that. It's a little more complex than that because this is not a new story. This yeah. is not the first time it's happened. And uh, in my lifetime, I mean, I'm just a couple of years old when uh, the first big riots hit after Dr. Martin Luther King is shot. 
There's a feeling that we've been here again and again and again and again. Does this one feel different to you in, in, for some reason? I think it feels different because there's literally no excuse. Like, you know, all these other ones, oh, well, he was running, well, he was this, well, he was talking back, or he punched the person, or he was, or he was an axe murderer, or, or whatever it was. I mean, this person, like a $20 counterfeit? You're gonna kill a guy over a counterfeit $20 bill that maybe wasn't even his? And it's in broad daylight? And everything that we had said, well, let's get body cams. They had body cams. Yeah. Well, let's, you know, make sure community, you know, people, you know, pay attention, you know, bring out the cell phones. All that was done, and the guy just sat there with his hands in his pocket. So uh, while he was killing somebody, so I think it, I think that the the the, the nature of it um, is 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 so much more shocking. It's so so much more more visceral, and there's no excuse. You can't point to a single thing after. Listen, even after first, minute two, it was justified. After minute four, five, six, seven, eight, it wasn't. So right. so you're now in that world, and so um, and then I think the other other thing is that the when when the, the local prosecutor came forward and charged only one of the officers with third degree murder. He's like the most horrific crime of the century recorded for the whole world. And you get third degree murder. I've never heard, I'm an attorney. I've never heard of third degree murder. Yeah, can you, can you do me a favor? And I, I know that this is uh, something that you've, you've studied. You are an attorney. I didn't understand third degree murder. And my 14-year-old uh, son asked me last night, what's third degree murder? And I was embarrassed that I couldn't, I didn't know, and I didn't know how that was even applicable. It didn't make sense to me. Yeah, a th third degree murder is like a oopsie murder. It's like, oops, it'd be like if, if you were just, if you were uh, driving past a, a house that you thought was empty and fired your weapon and oops, there was somebody in there. Like, like the intention was completely innocent, but you were maybe being reckless. That's what that is. Now, here's the problem with it. Prosecutors don't behave this way with everybody else, especially with black people. With everybody else, you'll get 27 charges and everybody standing around will also get arrested and get at least 15 charges. So you have maximum number of people you know, arrested because the standard for arrest is probable cause. I mean, you can arrest people for practically nothing. So everybody gets arrested and everybody gets charged with a thousand things and then you plead down from there. When this local prosecutor gives this cream puff charge that nobody's ever heard of, and that's it, and doesn't arrest anyone else, what, what's he going to do? He's going to plead down to a traffic ticket? I mean, you, you're, that, you're starting with third degree murder? That's when the protests, because everybody in the black community, uh-uh, this is the, the, the fix is in. And that's when it got worse, not better, because yeah. of the nature of the charges. Because yeah. it, it did feel there was also this lag time. Everyone saw that horrible video. It's completely inexplicable. And there was this lag time that uh, before anything was announced, anything was done. And you wonder, might things be different now if immediately uh, people had come forward and said, no, this was wrong. And here are the steps we're going to take: an immediate, you know, immediate investigation, and these, uh, uh, you know, these people are being placed under arrest. Look, I think that you'd still have protests for sure. Yeah. It was just so shocking. You would have protests, but it would have been a different kind, and you wouldn't have had the level of, of exasperation and frustration. I mean, you still have the three other officers not charged. You, the reason you charge everybody is because you get people to turn on each other. Um, you know, you, you, and probable cause is such a low standard. You can literally arrest and charge everybody. And then you figure it out. You have leverage to figure it out. The idea that they don't even want leverage. They don't even want leverage. I mean, the, it's, it's a complete double standard. And that's, again, so then it's salt in the wound. Like, nobody would be treated this way. If a white woman were being treated this way by anybody, it would be, I mean, the entire block would have come out and just tackled the guy. I mean, and yeah. so, and then, and then the prosecutor's behaving differently as well. There is a way out of this. Um, you know, I think a lot of people just feel total despair. I don't think that that's where we should stay. I don't think we should deny the pain, uh, but we shouldn't let the pain have the last word. Uh, there, there have been, you know, you know, there've been lynchings in the past. There've been bad cops in the past. Uh, and we've come through that as a black community, as an American community. Um, and there's an opportunity here, first of all, justice in this case means all the cops get charged 
there's no way that, you know, sitting around basically an accessory to murder, you should get away scot-free. Something needs to happen. Number two, there can be now common ground on this question of lawlessness uh, in law enforcement. Uh, there could be a bipartisan bill in Congress that would do some smart stuff. Like for instance, you know, one reason that you know, police officers act the way that they do, you can't sue them individually. So they have little total, total immunity. So no matter what happens, maybe they get demoted or fired, they still keep their house, they still keep their, their boat, they still keep their truck. So there's a way that that needs to be addressed. If you do something egregious, you should also be able to have your personal uh, 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 fortune at stake. That could be a break. You want to create checks and balances and breaks on, uh, I'm from a law enforcement family. My father was a cop in the military. My uncle uh, just retired from Memphis City Police Force. I understand, uh, you know, cops aren't Satan. They're not superheroes. They're just city employees. Some are good, some suck. You got to have systems to deal with the ones that suck. And if you just say, because somebody has on a blue uniform, I'm going to back them no matter what, that's not constitutional democracy. That's gang mentality. Mm -hmm. like, because of what you're wearing, I'm on your side. That's gang mentality. We're not, the reason that a, a democratic republic trusts a small group of armed men and now women with a monopoly on violence. Why? Because there's checks there's balances, there's process, there's laws. So we entrust you with a monopoly on violence in a system. Once you step out of that system and you start abusing that, if the system doesn't pull you back, now you just got lawlessness of the worst kind. Um, you have essentially a number of gangs in the community. <laughs> One of them just happens to have on a badge. That's not what you want, but that's what you've got in way too many neighborhoods and way too many cities. And right and left should disagree with that reality. Right and left should come together and say, let's fix that. Let's put some more tools in place, put some more checks and balances in place so that you can have the police obeying the law and therefore the citizenry obeying the law. And that's how you have peaceful streets. And nobody wants peaceful streets more. Nobody wants peaceful streets more than African-Americans. We're not a part of some pro-riot lobby or some pro-crime lobby. I'm raising two black boys here in Los Angeles. I do not want riots here. I just want lawful policing and peaceful streets, just like everybody else. Yeah, there's a, uh, I don't know how you react to, this This seems to happen whenever there's a uh, an incident like this, and sadly there are way too many of them, uh, you have people in the white community saying, and, and I'm gonna say the white liberal community saying, I didn't realize, I didn't quite realize the extent. And it feels a little bit like we fired on that. You know, that, that, that the time for people to be saying, I didn't realize, well, I didn't quite understand how bad it was. I'm catching up now that we have passed that point quite a while ago and that it's, it, there, there is no excuse. Hey, listen, I, I, I feel that way now. I do. There, there's a fatigue. This is just a fatigue. You know, why do you pay money to go to college? Why do you pay tuition? Because educating somebody is costly. Okay? It's costly. If I have to sit here and educate every one of my white friends every time something happens, I have to educate one of my white friends every Facebook post from a high school buddy, every well-intentioned colleague. It is costly. And they not paying me no tuition. <laughs> it's just a pure cost. Right. And at a certain point, you're like, can you do your own homework? Can you, do, can, can, you, can you just watch the 13th documentary? Can you just read the new Jim Crow? Just, just, just do a little bit so I don't have to do all of it myself every day. And usually I'm surrounded and outnumbered. If you're a professional black person, middle class black person, frankly, we're only 12% of the country. Most of the time you're surrounded and outnumbered and you're gonna have to now try to one more time create a free college for somebody else that you, know, you don't benefit from, you actually are drained by. It's tough. And you know, James Baldwin said it the best. He said, when it comes to issues of race, White people are always innocent. They're always innocent. And their innocence constitutes their crime. 
how can you be innocent this late? You know what I mean? Quit being innocent. This innocence act is now criminal. <laughs> like, yeah. just admit we live in a country with a terrible history. Nobody likes that reality. It's uncomfortable. But you sh the fact that you can run away from it 364 days out of the year doesn't mean you should. It, it just, it just, it's just a part of being in a democratic, multiracial, multicultural, multi-faith democracy. We have to work to learn about each other. And if you're in the majority, the whole country conspires to make sure you know your own history. They call that American history. You have to do a little bit more work to learn the Latino history, a little bit more work to learn the black history, a little bit more work to learn the Eskimo history or whatever you want to call it. That's, but that's, that's the price of being a good citizen in a multiracial democracy. And we're one of the few in the history of the world. It takes work. And all that work shouldn't just fall on my shoulders to do the educating. The... Um... I think there was a, and I think you've recently quoted it, but it was a interesting quote, I think from Malcolm X that he was, I, I, and, and you'll correct me, you probably know it better than I do, uh, but I think he said he was sometimes more afraid of a, a liberal, you know, someone who was well-intentioned but ignorant than he was of an outright bigot and uh, felt that in a way that could be more insidious. Is, is, do you feel that that's, something that we might be experiencing right now? Yeah, you know, I got in a lot of trouble uh, early in the week pointing it out, but you know, we're, we're, we're all friends here at some point, we have to speak honestly with each other. And there is a way, uh, and Malcolm, you know, he talked about the Southern wolf versus the Northern fox. He said that Southern wolf, you know, he bears his teeth at you and you know he's mad at you. You know he doesn't want you around. He said that, that, that Northern Fox, you, you know, you see, you, you might be smiling, you know, it, it looks a little bit more friendly, but it's still, you know, you're still in real danger. And so I do think we have to look at the fact that a lot of people who vote for Democrats, who support causes, who share all the right stuff on their Instagram page and all that sort of stuff, you know, to be honest, don't have a lot of personal black friends, don't have a lot of personal skin in the game, don't hire a lot of African Americans don't uh, uh, have African American lawyers or accountants or, or dentists or you know places where the black community does have a lot of professionals stacked up. They don't avail themselves of those services. Um, they will call the cops, just like that woman in Central Park, you know, in an instant, and you know, and act just like I mean, the Ku Klux Klan wouldn't have acted any better or any worse than that white woman in Central Park calling the police on that on that black man. For no reason, and and bird, saying he's a bird watcher. He's a bird watcher. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I'm really scared of a bird watcher. You know, in in, in the park. Okay. So, so these are the kinds of things. There's a real opportunity because if you're going to be honest, and this is a, this is the worst part. This is the worst thing I'll say say tonight. If you're going to be honest, there is a way in which white people choking off opportunity, choking off dignity choking off the, their ability to thrive and rise and looking like they're not doing anything wrong and blaming the black people, that's kind of America's thing. That's a little bit of our thing. And when you look in the face of that guy, he looked like he wasn't doing anything wrong. He has hands in his pocket and he's literally killing somebody. And if you ask him why, he say, because this guy's a threat. Well, hold on a second. <laughs> you have to have a very particular worldview to look at this picture and think the guy down there is a threat and that you're the, the, the innocent hero. Um, and yet the, we kind of do that, don't we? Boardroom after boardroom, deci hiring decision after hiring decision, bank decision after bank decision, somehow always the same group gets choked out and the other group benefits and they're innocent. And so these are the kinds of things that I would encourage people to think about. Is there some way that I'm like that guy? You know, am I kind of like that cop? Would I overreact? Am I afraid? Uh, am I giving enough oxygen <laughs> to the black people in my community? Uh, do I have enough of the uh, um, uh, 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 awareness of the pain? Do I have enough awareness of the suffering? Or am I looking away when everybody else in the world can see man, that community is suffering in your country. Yeah, I think what you're pointing out, and it, which makes a lot of sense to me, is it's very easy for people to watch that footage, that horrible footage, demonize those officers, say, that's terrible. I feel so terrible for you people. Mm -hmm. 
and I am on your side and it can all feel like an empty exercise. It can mm -hmm. all feel hollow and meaningless mm -hmm. as opposed to how did we get to that point? Right. And what can we do going yeah. forward? I'm curious. I, I, I try to avoid the Trump of things, not, not for any other reason that it can be such a big distraction. And I, I consider it a victory when I have long conversations with people where he is not discussed or he, he does not monopolize the conversation. Me too. What could a president do now today that would be meaningful? Let's, let's forget for a moment that which president it is. What could a president do today that would be meaningful and be a salve to the African-American community? Make them feel better and, and make them feel like they were heard. What would, what would it take? Well, you know, ironically, some of the things that Trump is actually doing, ironically, you know, have the Department of Justice and the FBI get in there and figure out what the heck is going on. That, that has, done, has been done and is being done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, receive a briefing directly in the Oval Office about it and then speak out publicly, which he also did. The situation that we're in is it's the things that he should stop doing that cause the problems. <laughs> Uh, the tweeting and this sort of stuff, um, but uh, there, there, you know, I'm trying to be fair with everybody. There have been things that that, that the Trump administration has done that are appropriate. Um, he should stop doing certain things, and then beyond what has been done, you know, we need to get together. We need to come together. If we don't come together, we're going to end up where we're headed. Where we're headed is not good. Um, you could have, I mean, we're about one more of these videotapes away from having, you know, five or six American cities burned to the ground. I mean, we're, this is not a good trajectory to be on as a country. And nobody would, would like that outcome. So we have an outcome that's looming that nobody wants. You can get everybody together. Man, would it be great for everybody to go to the White House. Everybody. NAACP, the NRA. I mean, everybody just go to the White House and just sit down and just cry and just have some ministers come and pray over everybody and, and, and for you know, secular people, you know, have some, some music, musicians come and just have a big cry. Mm -hmm. And then listen to law enforcement say how they don't like what's going on and they're willing to make some changes because obviously, you know, something's going on that they don't want. And listen to some of those you know, young kids talk about how I mean, those kids are so heartbreaking. I just want to be able to go to a white neighborhood and not feel afraid. I mean, simple things. And just, just get together. That's what I would like. Mm -hmm. Just get together. This is, this, you know, we, you know when, when the funeral happens, I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if, if, the, if all the Republican leaders and all the Democrat leaders were, were sitting in there? I mean, I guess they got a social distance or whatever, but, you know, if it, whatever it is, if, this is the time... Just say, listen, I can score points and you can score points. I can call you a racist and you can call me a socialist. I can say you're Antifa, you can say I'm a Nazi. I mean, we can do this. We've been doing this now for years. But this one, you've got to draw a circle around. And, 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 and Americans are drawing a circle around it. I mean, you know, the, the disturbances, that's different. But this, this particular murder, Americans have drawn a circle around. There, the, there, there, there is room now, I think, for a president to bring everybody together. I want to make sure I mention Reform Alliance. This is something you're the CEO of Reform Alliance and talk about taking action to move the puzzle piece a little forward. Tell us what it is. Well, you know, um, uh, Jay-Z and Meek Mill and Robert Smith and Robert Kraft and a, a bunch of billionaires, including Clara Wusai and uh, uh, Novogratz and Dan Loeb and, uh, and, and uh, Laura Arnold, all got together a year and a half ago and said too many people are, are going to jail uh, for petty stuff and too many people are caught up on probation and parole for too long and they're going back to jail for petty stuff. Let's do something to try to have fewer people going to jail for, for petty stuff. And because um, you shouldn't deprive people of their liberty lightly. And then between the COVID 
thing, which has now made the jails full of this plague and people are dying in the prisons in huge numbers. Um, and then this, you know, incident, you, we realize we're also, we're not just trying to pr protect liberty, we're trying to protect people's lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, we partnered with Jack Dorsey from Twitter to get masks into all the jails and prisons. Uh, we have legislation moving in, in a number of states to try to um, reduce the number of people going to, to jail for probation and parole violations, little non-crime technical violations. A lot of things like that. But this thing set us on our butt. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jay-Z himself uh, picked up the phone and called the governor of uh, Minnesota and asked him personally to make sure that the case was given to uh, the, the, the state attorney general, who happens to be African American, but who's also just a, a fair-minded prosecutor um, so that it wouldn't we wouldn't keep going down this road of having the local prosecutor screw up the case and then people burn down the country. And uh, thankfully for that reason and many others, the governor did give the case to a better prosecutor. So we have a better chance of justice. I think you have a better chance of, of, a, of a bipartisan bill that could really fix law enforcement in some important ways. And there also needs to be a better chance to put some money into these communities. Uh, you know, all these corporations and banks should get together Let's help these communities. We see what's going on. If, if, you, if you have justice, legislation, and economic opportunity, we can come out of this stronger and better. Uh, and that's, so I'm starting to feel some hope now for that. I'm starting to feel some hope. You know, I, we, we didn't really even get much of a chance to talk before uh, we hooked up on Zoom today. And so I wasn't sure what your state of mind was gonna be. Um, and again, I wanted you to do the talking and I'm hearing pain and I'm hearing anguish and frustration, uh, but I'm also hearing some hope that there might be an opportunity here. As, and I wanna be careful when I say that, and I'm saying there's an opportunity in a horrible situation, but there might be an opportunity here uh, to, um, to move ahead, to move up and to, get, and to be a little better. I, I think so. I think if people don't stop at pity, because pity burns out, it doesn't feel good. If we move to opportunity, if we move to saying, hey, listen, who knows? I mean, that guy that got killed and he might have cured cancer for all we know. We don't know who the heck that guy was or what, what, or what his kids could have become or whatever. Right, right. Um, so we're wasting some genius. We're missing out on some possible best friends we've ever had and some possible great employees or employers or contractors or, or neighbors. Um, what can I do in my personal life? People go, they, they, how can I fix the police department? Trust me, that's not easy, but your own workplace, you might be able to get an internship program in place. You might be able to mentor somebody. Um, don't forget how much you know, not from a book, mm -hmm. how much you know because somebody sat down and talked to you. One of the problems when you're black is it's hard to find a person who'll talk to you, honestly. You know, the conversation gets stiff or tense or whatever, and or it's just, it just doesn't happen because you're not even, you don't even know that that building you're driving past is a, lodge or a country club it's just a building you've never been invited in there and so you know is are there people you can mentor there are people who and the thing about mentorship is you always get more out of it than you give anyway it's not charity you wind up so much smarter and so much more interesting you know oh i'm talking to my, my 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 kid from the other side of town and now you're the most interesting person at thanksgiving you know so you always get more than you than you give but those are the things that i would ask people to do we're gonna have to change some laws but I tell you what, if we start changing uh, who's in our phone book, who, who's in our cell phone, who, who are we texting with every couple of days? Who are we, that's, that's really where the change has got to start happening. Because then, you know, suddenly, you know, somebody says something in the conversation, they say, yeah, hey, hold on a second. That's not funny. You know, I, I know a guy who's black. And, 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 and I've learned the hard way, that's, that, that, that can wind up killing somebody. And, no, and people, what, what? I, we didn't know that you were, Feeling that way? Well, I do feel that way now. And suddenly you start wiping this stuff out at the social level long before it ever gets to the legal level. And I think that's important. Well, I, uh, I cannot thank you enough uh, um, for, for doing this today. This, uh, uh -huh. it, uh, I've always loved talking to you in the past. We've had really good conversations and um, I, I did not want to hear my voice today. I, I, I was really happy that it could be your voice. So, hey, listen, um, you, you all, you've always been good to me. Yeah, every time I've had a show launch or a book, you've always had me on. And, you know, I'm glad it created a friendship between us. And now we can, can use it to try to bring a little bit of hope to people. And I'll come back anytime you have me, sir.
thank you so much. Uh, this was very meaningful to me, and um, I uh, stay well and uh, and and good luck with your kids and handling all of this. And let's keep the conversation going. Will do. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.